Thank you for joining us. Good morning. And I'm going to hand it over. And Sarah Bostic, thank you. Um, you are our sustainable agriculture agent if you want to uh, say hello and what you're going to talk about today. Sure. So hello, everyone. Um, it's so good to see names and faces. Um, and um, I'm really excited, actually, that I, I know almost none of you. There's a handful of folks on here that I know. Um, and one of the things that has been um, such a wonderful thing about going to such a virtual way of sharing information is that we get to meet people from all over the place. Um, people have been tapping into our programs from across Florida, across the United States, and even from other countries. So I'm, I'm so happy that all of y'all have joined today. And um, let's see, got funny things popping up on my screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and start um, sharing my screen um, and we'll get things rolling. Um, well. It'll just take me a minute to pull up a presentation that I have for y'all. Um, my computer's very slow this morning. Very, very slow, apparently. So while it is um, thinking about doing what I want it to do, um, I will, there we go. Um, I will just say that um, so my name is so, you know, for example, like that big block of green. That, that, that block of the country has a fairly similar kind of climate compared to the other colors. So you can see down here in Sarasota County, and I know that y'all have joined us from all over the state, but down here in Sarasota County, in DeSoto County, we're at this really unique place where um, green turns to pink. Um, and so that, in, in our particular little area of the state, um, can make understanding how to be really successful gardening even more challenging. Um, and you can see that the pink part of the state um, is climate-wise more, more similar to things like the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico than it is to Georgia. Um, so um, I just wanted to do some framing of that, of, you know, if Florida really is unique in how to grow things. So I'm going to make this really Florida specific. My screen just does not want to change slides. There we go. So some of the things that regardless of where you are in Florida um, are, are quite unique is how incredibly hot, humid, um, low latitude our, our growing conditions are, um, or our, our climate is rather. Um, and then we have, we have this thing called nematodes. Um, some of you might know what nematodes are already. Um, we will dive deep into the world of nematodes in a little bit because they tend to be, um, they're, they're a little microscopic worm um, and they tend to be one of the most hidden um, but common issues that school gardens and people that, that do urban growing in general struggle with in Florida. Um, so one of the things that's really important when you are, um, uh, when you're figuring out how to grow in Florida is making sure that you start with the right varieties. Those of you who are tied into school garden programs, getting your seeds and seedlings through school garden programs, um, hopefully that, that piece has already been thought through where the varieties that are being chosen are coming from um, the right sources, um, the sources that were bred for our really unique conditions. Um, I know that's something that Mindy and I really spend a lot of time on each year is making sure we're picking the right varieties for success in this area. So I'm going to start with, um, this is going to be a super, super brief, very shallow dive, um, no pun intended, into understanding soil. Um, and the first thing to mention is simply that um, when we talk about soil um, in terms of gardens, we could be actually talking about three really different things. Um, we could be talking about our native soil, um, like the soil that's you know, always been there um, in an undisturbed area, um, in, in the region that we're, that that, um, that Mindy and Wilma and I work in here in southwest coastal Florida, that um, this crazy picture that you can see on the right, or excuse me, the left side of your screen is um, a cross section where someone actually dug a really deep hole soil pit. Um, so you can see all the different natural layers of soil in our area. And in, in this area, our soil is called Mayaka fine sandy soil. There's other soil types in this area, but that's the predominant one. Um, and that's super sandy, no big surprise. You can see that very clearly in the picture. Other parts of Florida have um, soil that's really heavy in clay, um, might be silty, might be a really good um, combination of the three. Um, so even native soil differs a lot. 
Um, and an urban soil is, um, is a real mixed bag because you just don't know where it came from. Um, oftentimes fill is trucked in from um, you know, many miles away um, and it may, it may have been from any layer of soil. Um, so it may not actually correspond with what normal soil types are in an area. And then potting mix, which is often used in raised beds and things like that in urban areas, could actually be composed of anything. And we'll dive in in a minute and talk about how it might not even really be classifiable as soil. So that is the beginning point. So soil is really, really diverse. But one thing that is true of all soil across the world is that it is composed basically of four different categories of things in approximately these proportions that you see here on your screen. Um, about 25%, like, so if you pick up a handful of soil, um, about 25% of what you have in your hand uh, by volume is water, about 25% of it is air, about 45% of it is mineral, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, and about five-ish percent um, is something called organic matter, which we'll also dive into. And each of these four pieces is really, really important to, to manage for. Um, and understanding how these four pieces of soil work can go a really long way to be successful in gardening. So organic matter, the easiest way to think about organic matter is that it is anything that is or was alive. So things like Newer, um, anything that you put in a compost heap, leaves, straw, um, you know, insects, all sorts of things. And organic matter is truly incredible. Um, it is where um, soil microorganisms live, and soil microorganisms are this really incredible uh, ecosystem. There, there are billions and billions of microorganisms that fall into many different categories in, in soil, especially in healthy soil. And, and they, um, those are the little, the little um, microscopic and visible to the naked eye creatures that, that moderate um, available nutrients in your soil. Um, organic matter is also um, the really incredible part of soil that absorbs water. Without organic matter, water just basically passes straight through your soil. Um, so it's really important to, to learn a little bit about organic matter and how important it is in your, in your garden. Um, organic matter is also what holds on to nutrients so it doesn't just pass right through soil. Um, and soil, healthy soil needs plenty of space for air. And in um, natural, natural systems, um, so like not so much on the raised beds, um, but that's usually accomplished, space for air is usually accomplished by critters such as um, burrowing beetles, um, burrowing rodents, worms, things like that. Um, space for air is really important. And then, Mineral. Mineral is that section that um, mentioned about 45% of, you know, your handful of soil is composed of mineral. Um, so this is a really neat website. Um, there's, there's so many really neat websites that are available to teachers. Um, this, one, this particular one is called Soil Science Society of America, and they have some really great K through 12 um, soil science teacher resources. And um, so if you want to learn a little more about just the general properties of soil, this is a really good resource. And one of them, um, this particular page, this is just a copy and paste directly from their website. Um, right here, circled in what I circled in red, um, shows the three different kinds of minerals um, that are the predominant part of that mineral section. So in, in our area, in the Sarasota area of, of Florida, the the bulk of the mineral part of soil is just sand. Um, in, in more northern parts of Florida, it tends to be more on the clay side. Um, some parts of Florida have a little bit of silt in their soil as well. Well, let's see. I don't know why this is not wanting to change screens. There we go. Okay, so this, this will, um, all of this will start to come together in a little bit. I mean, this, the way I usually start workshops is that it sounds kind of like these disconnected pieces. And then over the course of a workshop, I try to pull all those pieces together. So this is one layer of pulling together some of what we just went through. So one of the, one of the reasons it's just important to know what kind of soil you're working with and understanding a little bit about the unique characteristics of your soil is that different soil types just grow things really differently. You're going to have a really different experience working with different kinds of soil. 
Um, different soil types have really different pH. Um, they have a different ability to hold nutrients and water. Um, and pH is this really mysterious thing. Um, it's one of those things that is really hard to um, hard to define. Um, and and um, in my soil class, I dive in more into how to define pH. Um, but for our purposes, what it's important to know is that pH affects the avail availability of soil nutrients. So even if you're doing a great job of, of fertilizing, if you have a pH that's really wonky, um, you may not be getting the same effects from those nutrients um, as you would if your pH was a more more balanced, somewhere around 6.5. So I'm going to show you, this is, um, yeah, my screen just really does not want to change today. There we go. So just um, just a couple of days ago, actually, a school school garden in, um, in Sarasota County, um, I got some of their test results from a, a few different, um, a few different beds. Um, some of them were in ground, some of them were raised beds, um, and I pulled out some of the most important pieces so that you can see a little bit about what a soil test might look like and what it means. So uh, circled here in yellow, you can see um, that for this vegetable garden, there's a, you know, the optimum pH is 6.5, um, but this particular garden bed had a pH of 5.0, um, and to put that into some context, that that's approximately the same acidity as black coffee. Um, and anyone who has had coffee on uh, black coffee on an empty stomach knows that that is pretty high acid. Um, and so even if that's as much as you really understand about, about pH, um, that I think, you know, being able to think about it in terms of trying to water your plants with black coffee and knowing that that would not have a great result, I think can help to clarify some of this pH mystery. So here is another, um, another one of their soil test results. You can see um, this one was actually in a raised bed where they bought in some, um, some compost that happened to have a pretty high pH. Um, and this is a pH that is pretty much on par with um, like human blood or ocean water. And again, you, you, know, you kind of intuitively know that that's not quite the right pH for, for growing vegetables. Um, so, that's all I'll say on pH, um, but just know that it does have a lot of impacts. Um, and so um, if you've never done a soil test before in your school garden or your community garden or your home garden, um, I encourage you to, to do one. It'll give you a really good baseline about what's going on in your soil. Um, and if you happen to have issues like you can see with these um, crazy looking strawberry plants in this picture, uh, this is a great way to get, to potentially get some answers about um, why, why things are not going quite the way you think they should. Um, and the strawberry plant in this, um, in this picture actually has a very severe iron deficiency, not because there is not enough iron in its soil, but because um, it actually had a, um, an extremely high pH. Um, and it was the, the pH, the actual soil chemistry was blocking the ability of the plant to pull that iron up into the plant. So, um, you know, there's, there's many things that you can test for. Um, if you are in an urban area and you are planting directly into um, in-ground soil, um, AKA like you haven't brought in other soil, um, you know, like potting mix, those sorts of things, it's a really good idea to, to get it tested for lead and other heavy metals. Urban areas, um, the, the soil of urban areas often are, have very elevated lead and heavy metal um, levels. So get those tested. Um, and then um, there's many different ways you can go about soil testing. Uh, there's check with your local extension office. University of Florida also has a soil testing lab in Gainesville that you can mail your soil samples to. And there's private labs all over the state that you can just drop off samples to as well. Um, well sorry, this is just gonna be clunky between every single slide. There we go. So if you have a garden um, where you're going to be growing um, mostly in pots or small planters, something like an earth box, um, which is actually designed in Florida. Um, if you've never heard of earth boxes, they're a really neat product. Um, there's others like it, um, but it's a really neat um, kind of self-watering planter box. Um, but the reason I put soil in quotations is because most of these potting mixes don't actually meet the, like, the official definition of um, of soil, um, but they can be really, really handy. Um, you can also make your own. Um, they, need, they need a few different things. Um, they need some sort of 
some sort of base. Um, and that's usually either peat moss or coconut bar or something like that. And that gives it a lot of fluff. Um, it doesn't give it, doesn't give the roots a whole lot of nutrients to pull up, but it gives, um, gives space for a lot of air. And then perlite is that those funny little white bits that you see in these pictures. Um, and, and perlite helps also with, with air and, um, and water retention. And you can see in this raised bed here, um, you can see the little bits of perlite. Um, a lot of times folks look at those little white bits and think that it's some sort of fertilizer or chemical sort of thing, but it is not. Um, perlite is actually a naturally occurring mineral rock. Um, and down here in this picture, you can see, this is such a, uh, perlite is such a mystery to people that I wanna explain it a little bit. So it is mined, um, it is a mined rock, which you know, unto itself is a little bit of a complicated thing. Um, and then it is mechanically crushed by big machinery. And then it is heated up to a very, very high temperature. And then it literally pops like popcorn. Um, and, then, and then you get those little white fluffy bits that kind of look like pieces of styrofoam. That's a, a crushed, superheated, popped like popcorn rock. Um, and you can see, um, I just wanted to put this ingredient list up here. This is from a bag of um, organic potting mix. Um, it's often got just really odd sounding ingredients um, to people that are not familiar with reading the backs of bags. Um, it has things like fish meal and bone meal and things like that. Those are really normal ingredients on um, in organic, in organic um, potting mixes. So I just wanted to highlight that because um, sometimes people get a little weirded out by ingredient lists, but those are, those are really, really normal um, things to find in in potting mix. Um, so if you are going the route of raised beds, um, usually, usually putting something underneath those raised beds will do you a lot of good over time. Um, something like black fabric that you can see in these pictures, that just really helps keep, keep the weeds out. Um, and if you are in a very urban area and you know you have some soil contamination issues, you definitely want to put some sort of barrier beneath your raised beds so that heavy metals can't rise up through the soil. Uh, if you are, if you need larger quantities um, than what you can get from, um, you know, a bag or something like that, if you need larger quantities of soil um, or potting mix, then you will likely end up needing to purchase, um, you know, like quote unquote topsoil or compost by the yard or, or something of that nature. Um, and these, these products are not, um, not regulated in the same way that bagged and labeled products are. Um, so when you buy bulk, it's a little, it's much less regulated as to what actually is in those products. Um, but um, you should be able to ask the company you're, you're buying from for a laboratory analysis of, of whatever it is that you're buying. And you, wanna, um, you really want to shoot for a product that has a pH between six and seven. Um, that's that's kind of the, the magic number. Um, I see a lot of, a lot of um, school gardens that are struggling and they can't figure out why they're struggling and their plants just keep looking unhealthy. And then we send off for a soil test and it comes back that their, their garden soil has a pH of, um, I, I've seen it as high as 8.7. Um, 8.7 doesn't sound like a whole lot more than seven, um, but it's actually magnitudes higher in pH. And um, it's really hard to grow almost anything successfully in a pH that's that high. Um, so you definitely wanna uh, make sure that you're not setting yourself up for failure um, unknowingly by purchasing a product that seems good, but actually its soil chemistry is a little bit off. And asking a company um, for a laboratory analysis is the easiest way to make sure that it's not. Um, another thing that I've um, seen sometimes when school gardens are struggling and they've they've purchased in bulk compost or bulk topsoil is that um, the salinity, like the actual salt level in their, their potting soil is, um, is quite high. Um, and no big surprise, um, plants don't like to be in really salty soil. That's why not many things grow at the beach. Um, well, there's many reasons why things don't grow well at the beach, but um, very salty soil is one of those. Um, and then if you know that you're, the, the um, the mix that you're buying um, might have manure in it. You also want to ask for an herbicide residue test. Um, 
there are um, persistent um, herbicides that can um, make it straight through um, a horse or a cow's digestive system and straight through the composting product process and still persist for another couple of years um, before they break down. So if there's any chance that manure is in what you are purchasing, you definitely want to ask for an herbicide residue test as well. Um, Mindy, are there any questions so far? I have one. Um... To, to clarify between when people are buying like the bagged um, like organic mixes or black cow, mm -hmm. um, that type of material versus the bulk, is the bagged material more likely to be at like the, at a normal pH like, yes. in other words, will they find the information on there that they need on the bag? Or is it just do done as part of that company's process versus if they're per if they have a bigger garden and they're buying in bulk? That's a great question. So you won't find um, pH information right on the bag that you're buying, um, but in general, the the bagged products are created for home gardens with with the knowledge in mind that. If, if, um, if homeowners or whoever is buying that bag product uses it and they have issues uh, because of wonky pH, that product's probably going to be returned. Um, so, um, so in general, pH is at a pretty good level with those bagged products. You can also directly call whatever the company is and ask for that information. Um, but, but yeah, in general, it's a pretty standard across the board, very consistent product that you get in bags. Um, and whereas with bulk products, um, part, of, part of what's different about bulk products is that the feed material that went into creating that compost um, or that, that potting mix may change depending on, you know, what kind of debris and things like that um, they, um, they, they've they have been receiving. So there may be a good bit of fluctuation. Um, okay, I'm going to keep just cranking on. Um, so fertility and fertilizer is such a um, such a such a tricky tricky little thing to manage. Um, compost is such a wonderful thing to do with kids. Um, compost can also be a really hard thing to do in urban areas. You tend to get a lot of critters. Um, rats are not uncommon in um, in urban compost systems, especially open systems like the one that you can see right there in the middle. Um, this is actually a picture from our office. Um, we at our office we have not had issues with rodents, um, but they are certainly not uncommon in urban areas. So you may want to consider something like um, a worm bin. That's a pretty neat way to go about creating your own compost um, with kids um, using worms. And um, it's, it's pretty fun. If you've never heard of a worm bin, I highly encourage you to look into it. Um, so if you are indeed a school garden or even a community garden, in general, um, I would encourage you to stay away from um, manure products, um, unless it is something that's bagged, like um, like a black cow or some other product of that nature. Um, bagged products have to be very um, rigorously tested for things like E. coli and salmonella, um, but I would, I would steer away from getting, um, getting a delivery of something like this, um, uh, pile, piles of poop. Um, you know, it's something that farms absolutely use, but they are very well equipped to do it. Um, and there's a lot of food safety regulations that regulate how farms um, manage manure on their farms. Um, there's a lot of federal regulation around it to make sure that, um, that people don't get sick. So in general, it's, it's better just to steer clear of raw manure products if you are a school or community garden. Um, so I know um, many, if not most, of the school gardens around um, the state tend towards um, encouraging or requiring that the products that go into their school gardens are, um, or are organic or are you know, labeled for organic use. So, you know, and if that's, if that's not the category that your school garden or community garden falls into, um, the, that decision really is a personal one as to whether or not you buy organic or synthetic products to feed, in, feed into your garden. Um, but if you, if you need to or want to be buying uh, products that are listed for use in organic systems, you want to look for this little label uh, right here, this OMRI listed for organic use. 
Um, OMRI stands for the Organic Material Review Institute. Um, and it's, um, it's basically, um, it's, it's the number one and, and most commonly used um, independent reviewer um, that gives something the, the stamp of approval for use on organic systems. I'll show you a couple of bags of fertilizer um, and I'll show you where that OMRI stamp usually is on those bags in just a second. So regardless of what fertilizer you do choose, um, just remember that more is not better. Um, folks generally tend towards um, if a little bit's good, then maybe a lot's better. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why um, that isn't the case, including that especially if you're working with really sandy soils, all those extra nutrients that you're putting in, they're just going to leach right right out um, through, through our extremely sandy soil that does not hold water or nutrients very well. So you're gonna lose what you've put in. Um, and then too much nitrogen can also um, make certain kinds of infect, insect infestations much worse, things like aphids, which I'll mention again a little bit later. So this is, um, this is, I'm not advocating in any way for this particular brand. This was just a, a bag that we had in our office. So this, this was a useful picture for me to be able to take. Um, right there, I just circled in yellow. Um, you can see the label right there where it says OMRI listed. That's how you know this product actually is um, an organic product. So if you, need to, if you need to be using organic products, that's the symbol. It's often really hidden, not always the easiest thing to see. That's what you need to look for. Um, just the word organic on the product does not make it actually an organic product. Um, and then this is generally what organic fertilizers tend to look like. Um, it's a whole big kind of crushed up mess of all sorts of um, animal and plant derived um, nutrients right there. It tends to look quite different than, than um, conventional fertilizers if you're used to looking at conventional fertilizers. So this is, um, this is a really overwhelming visual, right? Um, and this is something that um, we hear a lot from schools and other um, people who are just getting started with gardening is um, how in the world do I know how much to fertilize and when? And th the directions are all on the bag, but this is a lot of information and it's not the most digestible information. Um, you know, so like for example, for tomatoes, peppers, and herbs, you have one set of directions for new plantings, another for established plantings, and they involved things like mixing one and a third cups per 10 square feet. And, you know, trying to do this with, you know, people who are perhaps in third grade um, is maybe not, maybe not the simplest process, right? So I encourage you, um, you know, as the, as the adult or as the, the garden manager to read through these instructions, kind of get your head wrapped around them a little bit, um, and then, hand kids a teaspoon um, or a tablespoon. Um, in general, with organic fertilizers, most plants, um, the, the needs of most plants, it's really, it's really easy to just correlate them with a tablespoon. So give kids a spoon, um, and it's about a spoonful of organic fertilizer per plant um, is probably the easiest way to do that. That's a lot easier than trying to explain to kids the need to do one and a third cups per 10 square feet. So the next step is when do you fertilize? Um, and this, this, uh, the answer to that is it depends. Um, and there's so much about, uh, about gardening that falls into the category of it depends. Um, so with, um, so I'm gonna give you the four, kind of the four different categories that I, I generally break things down into. The first is um, something that you, you grow, it's a leafy green of some sort, like a head of lettuce, um, and you harvest it once and it's done. Most of those are only in the ground for, you know, 30 to maybe 60 days, but usually no more than a month. So they really only need fertilizer one time, only when you plant them. But something like the collard greens um, or kale, um, other things that fall into that multiple harvest, Swiss chard, um, or like the, the collards that you see in this picture, um, plant, fertilize when you plant it. And then um, they, they tend to be, if all goes well um, and, and your garden stays good and healthy, um, they tend to be in the ground longer. They, they may be in the ground as long as three or four months. Um, and so a few weeks after the first time you harvest, it's a good idea to give them a little bit of extra food um, just so they continue to have enough energy to keep producing those big, beautiful leaves. For root crops, um, 
like the radishes that you see in this picture, um, generally one time is enough. Uh, so there's two different places that plants send their energy. They can send their energy down into their root system and they can send their energy up into the leaves. And when uh, most, most fertilizers have a good bit of nitrogen in them. And so when, um, when you add nitrogen fertilizer to a garden, most of that nitrogen gets sent up into growing more leaves. And so with root crops like a carrot or a radish, turnips, beets, you actually want the part that's the root. Um, so by adding too much um, fertilizer or fertilizing too often, you, you likely will end up with really big, beautiful, lush um, leaf system on the plant and much, much less of a root system than you had than you had been banking on. So generally one time is enough. Um, if it's something that's in the ground for a really long time, um, uh, you might wanna um, fertilize again, but generally you're good with just the one. And then crops that produce fruit. So things like eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, um, squash. Uh, producing fruit takes an enormous amount of energy for a plant. Um, it is kind of on par with, um, with you know like a human pregnancy um, it takes a lot of energy to create a baby um, and similarly fruit is the reproductive system of a plant and it takes a lot a lot of energy um, to achieve fruit and so in general fruiting crops need to be fertilized more often they also tend to be in the ground for longer than all the other crops which which enhances their need for fertilizer so you generally fertilize those when you plant them when the plant is almost mature, and then when that plant starts to really, um, really get going, making fruit, giving one more boost. Again, my screen doesn't want to change. Okay. Um, I'll stop for questions in just a second, um, but I'm going to go through one more little section first. Um, so watering. Um, watering. Watering can be really mysterious. Um, in my experience of, of working with folks that are, um, that are relatively new to gardening or have been kind of limping along with gardening for a really long time, um, watering is watering's probably the trickiest thing to really master. It's kind of this, it's this um, in between of um, an art and a science um, to, to really figure out the right amount of water. So some rules of thumb, um, and these sound really, really obvious, but when you're actually standing there in front of a garden, um, sometimes the obvious goes right out the window. So um, some, of the, some of these obvious but easy to forget rules of thumb is that the smaller the plant is, the less, wa the less water it needs. You know, just think about how much liquid a very young child needs compared to a full, full grown person, simply a different amount of water. But that doesn't mean that they need, um, that small plants need water less frequently per se. They may simply need less water, but just as frequently as large plants do. Um, and it really needs to be a process of kind of trial and error and paying attention to what's happening. Um, and one thing that I actually forgot to put in a little, um, a little, um, section on. Um, but get in the habit as you're learning how much water your plants need of sticking your hands actually down in that soil. Um, we, we generally have the tendency to give plants enough water um, only to, to really wet the top inch or two of, of soil and that's not enough for, for mature plants. Um, when plants are really tiny, that generally does tend to be enough, but when plants get much larger, their root systems, your you're hoping are gonna go down a foot or more. And so you need to actually saturate the soil sufficiently to get water down a whole foot. Um, and that may take a whole lot more water than you realize. And the only way to know whether or not that water has gone down is to stick your hand in the soil and figure out um, exactly how far down things are wet. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about mulch in a moment, um, but mulch is a, an amazing way to help minimize the amount of water that you need to provide to your plants. Sarah, before we get to mulch, mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple questions. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, somebody was asking if there was a place or a way to get like Florida native soil, um, is that available anywhere and is there benefit to that? That's a really good question. Um, 
Wilma, are you still on? And do you have an answer for that? And they're in Florida, but they're not necessarily in our county. So mm -hmm. I don't know. So, I mean, we can think broadly as far as location. Okay. Florida native soil varies so much from place to place, and most of the soil, like Mayaka sand, isn't something you really want to plant and without adding some organic matter anyway. So it wouldn't be a lot of benefit to getting Florida native soil, in, in my opinion. Yep, and I would, I would agree with that. And um, another layer that we'll, we'll add to that in a little bit um, as to why it's not necessarily a great idea to just go dig soil from one place and put it in a raised bed is nematodes. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about nematodes in a bit, but that is, that's a pretty significant reason to not um, go seeking Florida native soil to put in a raised bed, if, if raised beds are what you're working with. Okay, and then um, one thing when you mentioned watering was, um, can you, like talking about the smaller plant not necessarily needing as much, but I know mm -hmm. when we did plantings um, our, ourselves, you uh, had us um, really get that soil really, really wet. Um, For sure you know, a, a, and would you say a day or two prior? And I've noticed out at school yeah. gardens, if people had done that prior to planting, there was a different rate of success of those plants. So what are For your sure. Definitely, and I've, let's see, I'll come back to those. Yeah, so exactly that. Um, you, um, it is, it is a huge piece of, of um, the success versus failure um, puzzle to really, really saturate your, uh, especially raised beds um, like the one you see in this picture before you plant at least a couple days in advance. Um, that soil can get so dried out that it, it literally doesn't have the capacity to rehydrate without some very substantial amount of rain. Um, you know, and so generally when we are um, doing our fall planting here, it's kind of at the tail end of, of our really rainy season and so if if it's been dry for a couple of weeks you're probably going to have to put in um, fairly mind-boggling amounts of water to get your soil to rehydrate um, and it's it, it, will, it will very quickly look nice and wet on the surface and then you dig back um, about a quarter inch down and you will discover um, after you've been watering for 15 minutes straight that it's managed to saturate exactly about a quarter inch deep. Um, you know, so you so really pay attention to that. Um, if you have volunteers that can help you with that process, tap into volunteers. Um, and to give you an idea of how much water is needed, um, this is a this is a really handy little chart. Um, this is this is very specific to Sarasota County, but this is um, information that's from the national. Um, Oh, uh, what is, I can't, I always, National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, which is part of our government. Um, so you can find average rainfall for whatever part of um, the state um, you live in. Um, and I, to me, this is really helpful um, to see, you know, like about how much water am I going to need to provide to plants beyond what just rain is going to during different parts of the year. So most, most mature full-size plants, um, you know, like big plants that are ready to harvest, need about one to two inches of water every single week. And th these are, um, this chart is of average rainfall over the course of a whole month. So you can see, you know, like for example, in April, um, when we're still, still in garden season, very much in garden season, um, the entire month of April, adds up to enough rain um, for ma mature plants. So you can, you can see that in parts of the year, you're gonna really need to give quite a bit of supplemental water, especially down here in the Southern part of Florida, our growing season is basically the dry season. So give you a little word problem. Um, I love word problems. I was never very good at them in school, but now I enjoy them a lot because um, um, they're so relevant. Um, I do end up doing word problems a lot with um, figuring out farming related things. So um, to take information from that chart that we were just looking at, um, the average, so it basically took the average rainfall from June through September, averaged it out. It's about eight inches of rain per month that falls during those months. And then each month has around four and a half weeks in it. Divide eight inches of rain by four and a half weeks, 
that averages out to about one and three quarter inches per week falling during the summer. So you know exactly how rainy it is during the summer in Florida. Um, and that, uh, if, you, if you divide it out nice and evenly, that's actually about how much water plants need mature plants need during our dry, the dry part of our growing season. So just to give you some perspective of um, providing enough water for plants really is a, a very significant part of success in gardens. Um, and of course, during our, our rainy season, we don't tend to get a nice even distribution of 1.75 inches of rain per week. We tend to get six inches today and then, you know, nothing for four days and, and things like that. So our, even in the summer, our rainfall pattern does not tend to be perfect, but just wanted to give you an idea um, and give it some perspective. I already looked at that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about mulch. Um, so before, um, before I came to this job, um, I was working at the, um, on campus at the University of Florida. This was actually a few years ago. And um, I was hired to, to manage a really neat on-campus program um, called the Field and Fork Farm and Garden Program. And I had seven acres on campus to experiment with. And I worked with kids from all different, not kids, sorry, students, both um, undergrad and graduate students, as well as professors um, from all different disciplines, all different departments. And this was really a seven acre space where we got to experiment and grow things one way compared to another um, and see, see how if you did it this way, how did it work and compared to this way. Um, and then all the food that we grew went into the emergency food system, both on campus and around Gainesville. But I love this picture. Um, it's not the world's best picture, um, but the story that it tells is. So this is a side-by-side -side planting of lettuce. These, um, these lettuce were planted, uh, they're the same variety of lettuce, planted um, on the same day out of the same trays. Um, both, of, both of these beds of lettuce that you can see, um, one that's mulched with hay or straw rather, and one that's on bare soil, um, both of them um, got exactly the same amount of fertilizer and both of them have those, those black tubes that are running that you can see in the picture, the drip irrigation system. And the irrigation would come on at exactly the same time, the plants would get exactly the same amount of water. And I'm guessing that you can see from this picture um, that these are two really different looking crops of lettuce. Um, everything was the same about them except that one, um, one set of three rows was mulched with straw and one was not. Um, and so there's quite a few, um, quite a few things that you can glean from this picture. Um, but covering soil is a really, um, really amazing tool to put in your toolkit when it comes to successful gardening. Um, soil is not meant to be bare, um, as it's not natural for soil to be bare, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, soil that is bare dries out very quickly. It also heats up really, really high compared to, to um, covered soil. And remember, soil is full of billions of microorganisms. And those microorganisms need a really particular range of temperature. And when the soil heats up so high that it's actually painful for you to walk on barefoot, um, the microorganisms in your soil are having the same experience. And um, so are the, the roots of the plants. So bare soil is, can be really, really stressful to plants. Um, and so they require more water. Um, they tend to have um, root systems that struggle a little bit more. Um, they, you'll also have more weeds that pop up and compete. You'll have to do more weeding if, you're, if, you, don't, if you have bare soil. Um, and then there's two other pieces um, that, that mulch can really help with with vegetable gardens. Um, and one is that because the plants are so much less stressed in mulched soil, um, they, there's two differences. One is that they tend to have a much softer texture. Um, the, the happier plants are, the more pleasant the texture of the plant is going to be. Um, plants that are really struggling are going to be tough, they, like literally tough leaves, um, because they've had to be really tough to survive. Um, and then you'll also have much sweeter um, leaves in mulch soil. And again, um, there's some actual chemicals that are produced in really stressed plants that, that, um, that add to the bitterness of, of some, some types of leaves. So there's so many reasons to mulch. Um, and um, the big question is always, so what do you mulch with? Um, and there's all sorts of things that you can mulch with.
Spanish moss is actually one of my favorites. Whenever um, after storms here at the office, I just go around and pick up big clumps of Spanish moss that have fallen and, um, and I just keep adding them to the garden. I think it's beautiful. Um, it's completely free. Um, it regenerates. Um, it was created in place. Um, pine needles work just fine as long as you don't incorporate them into the soil. Pine needles are very acidic. Um, so if you push them down into the soil, like actually incorporate them, um, a lot of that acidity will leach out and, and uh, can create some imbalances and nutrient issues in your soil. But as long as they're sitting on the top, um, they make a really good mulch. Um, same with wood chips. Wood chips, um, you just want to make sure wood chips never actually um, get incorporated down into your soil. Um, but they can make a decent mulch in a garden bed. They're, they're, they're probably my least favorite um, thing to mulch a garden bed with, but if you're in a pinch, use them. Um, and then I have mulch straw with a question mark next to it um, because in, in general, um, mulch straw um, is a great thing to mulch with in your garden bed, um, but you need to be super careful um, because straw, mulch straw, when it's being grown, um, especially in Florida, because we have so many poisonous pasture weeds. Who knew that we have dozens of weeds that can actually um, make sick or kill um, livestock um, if, if they eat it. And the best way to deal with that um, over large acreages of, um, of pasture and hay fields is to spray persistent herbicide. And persistent herbicide is like any other herbicide, um, a pro is, is a chemical that will kill plants, um, kill um, non-grassy plants, such as everything you've planted in your garden. So um, if you are buying mulch straw, just make sure that you know exactly where it came from and get a really clear answer about whether or not that straw could have been sprayed by a persistent herbicide anytime in the last two to three years. That's about how long it holds up. Um, mulching also can really help to prevent a lot of plant diseases. Most of the diseases that we, we struggle with here in Florida are um, hang out in the soil, just waiting for the next plant to come, upon, come, up, come by. Um, and the way that most of those soil-borne diseases um, get into the plant is not through the root system. It's actually by splashing up onto the leaves of the plant. So if you keep the soil covered, um, that splashing really doesn't happen. Um, and it, it very much helps to, to minimize um, the spread of certain kinds of diseases. Um, the picture on the left is from our office. You can see various things that we have mulched with there and some really happy, um, healthy, happy plants in there. Um, and we, we mulch the pathways with wood chips and then use things like mulch straw and leaves and um, Spanish moss in the beds. And then I want to show you um, one more one more little plug for um, for mulch is just on that the weed suppression side of things. Um, I want to just go through this really quickly. So one one of the truths in life is that nature abhors bare soil. Bare soil is not meant to be in, in nature. And the way that nature takes care of bare soil is with weeds. Um, weeds are, weeds have evolved to grow very, very quickly um, and cover disturbed soil so that that soil is not lost to wind and erosion. So when they pop up in your garden, um, weeds are doing their job. They are doing exactly what they have evolved to do. Um, a lot of people feel like, you know, like dang weeds, you know, like why do they keep coming up? Well, it's, it's because that's exactly what they've evolved to do. We've created a system that inherently is not natural. We've disturbed, we've disturbed systems and put plants in that were, you know, were never naturally there. And so weeds are doing exactly what they are designed to do. And unfortunately, weeds are workaholics. They will work us all. Uh, they will outwork all of us. Um, and this, um, this picture is from our office. I took, uh, I guess, a month ago, almost exactly a month ago. Um, it was the first time I'd been back to the office in quite a while. And um, some of the really fantastic master gardeners in our office and I created um, a poisonous pasture weed demonstration that is now um, just a tangle of weeds. Um, and this is what happened even with mulch um, after being abandoned for three months. Um, it turned into just it, nature reclaimed basically. Weeds, weeds did exactly their job. They reclaimed. So even with mulch you do still have to keep up with weeds. Um, but 
they really help to slow things down. If you want to um, read the blog that I wrote about, um, about this explosion of weeds, there's the link for that. Um, this is a good time to pause for questions, some more questions. Are there questions, Mindy? Hello. <laughs> so um, one of the questions was in relation to the pictures at the office as far as the the height of the raised beds, oh, yes. um, how there was some difference. Um, so I think in our office it wasn't done for any particular reason, but I was just wondering if um, if you have recommendation or thought on height for raised beds, if, gonna, yeah. if you're going to use those. That's a great question. Um, I, um, yeah, and these, all of these beds predate me coming to the office, so I don't actually know what the original thought process was behind the, diff the varying heights on these. Um, but I, um, part of, we actually, there's eight beds in total at the office. Um, there's, I guess, three of them that you can't see in this picture, but they're, you know, they're all different heights. And um, so part of, when I plant these out um, each season, part of what I think through is um, the appropriate depth of um, of raised bed compared to what the thing is that I'm trying to plant. So for example, I know that the tomatoes will grow in one of these really short beds, um, but they're gonna be a lot happier in one of the deeper beds. Um, you know, it, it, as a generalization, this is a sweeping generalization, but it's a, it's a decent rule of thumb. Um, the, the amount of root system that a plant has is relatively similar to the amount of above ground plant. So if you think about how big a tomato plant can get, um, you know that it has a whole lot of root under that underground. And so having only eight inches of soil to grow in, you're, not, you're just not going to get the same happy, healthy, um, sturdy tomato plant that you would with more space. Um, things that grow really quickly, like radishes or salad mix or even heads of lettuce, things like that, they're totally fine with about eight inches of soil. You know, there's, that's about as tall as they get in life, um, and so that's about as much as they need underneath the soil. Um, so yeah, you know, if, if, you know, but don't, don't let soil depth um, entirely keep you from planting something. Just know that you might have to baby something a little bit more if what you have is a really shallow um, raised bed. Does that answer that well enough? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay. Another, um, question, yep. or not question, but the guy, the person who was asking about um, the native soil, it was for um, experimentation, soil remineralization and geotherapy research. So oh, is it that you can get that? I mean, I, I would think some of the places, that's, bigger places that sell soil might have soil from land that was being cleared or something like that, but that's all I could think of. For sure. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, check in with folks that are about to start a new subdevelopment. Um, all that topsoil gets cleared out. Um, you can check with, um, uh, you know, maybe check in with farmers and ranchers in whatever area you're trying to study. Um, you know, they, they have equipment um, so they could... They can, they can dig holes, um, things like that. Um, yep, that's it. Yeah, it's really, that's so interesting. So, um, I love, I love hearing about interesting research that's happening. Uh, thank you for that, Roma. So, um, spacing. So spacing, kind of like watering, um, tends to give people a lot of issues as they're trying to figure out the magic way of spacing things. Um, I kind of liken it to um, like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears um, sort of scenario. Um, there's like the too close, the too far apart, and the just perfect, but figuring out um, exactly, exactly what is too close and what is too far apart and what is perfect can really be um, a process of trial and error. So I just wanted to go through um, these, um, these two pieces because you know, I've, I've done plenty of planting with kids. And one thing that is almost always true is that perfect spacing very, um, very infrequently happens. Um, <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to highlight some of what you might experience if your kids um, tend towards the much too close spacing. Um, you, you tend to have much bigger issues with mold, mildew, and other diseases in plants. You tend to get small, stunted, or spindly plants. Um, the cauliflower that's in this picture, um, that is a full-grown head of cauliflower. Um, it was not going to get any bigger. Um, that's in the hand of one of my interns when I was working at the University of Florida. Um, this was cauliflower that um, 
somebody had planted way too close together. Um, and so, you know, it was a perfectly, it was actually a perfectly happy plant. Um, it was just so closely spaced with other plants that it reached full maturity um, with basically like a two bite size head of cauliflower instead of like a two pound head of cauliflower. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one thing that will certainly happen when you, when you plant too close or can happen. Um, with root crops, you also like, like radishes and beets and turnips and carrots and things like that. Um, you'll get kind of funky shaped roots and often ones that are kind of tough, um, like actually not very good for eating, um, kind of like chewing on a stick. Um, and then early bolting, um, and bolting is just the fancy um, botanical world way of saying um, flowering. Um, so with most of the crops that we grow, um, you know, with, with like greens and herbs and things like that, um, we're growing them for the leaves. Um, and then once they, once they kind of get stressed out and decide to finish their life cycle, they, they produce flowers. Um, and so you want to, you want to minimize um, when, um, when that flowering happens as, or push back when that, ha that happens as late as possible. And spacing things really close in, um, increases the plant's stress and it increases how quickly it's, it's going to produce flowers and be done with its life. And then if you, um, if you plant too far apart, th this is like way, way less of a big deal. You know, you've wasted some space. There's a little more space for weeds. Um, you may end up with bare soil. You can solve that with mulching. Um, and then for really heavy plants, um, that, or uh, plants that produce really heavy fruit, um, the plants will be a little bit less stable in the soil because they won't have each other as support, but you can use cages and things like that if you end up planting things too far apart. Um, you can also tuck other little quick growing plants around um, larger growing plants if there's some wasted space in there. So if you're going to err on one side, go for the too far apart. Um, you'll have way fewer problems compared to the too close. So what is the right spacing? So again, here's just some um, little rules of thumb for seeds. Like if you're putting seeds directly in the soil, in general, um, you're going to aim for um, one, two, three, or four inches between each seed. And that really corresponds with the circumference of the part of the root that you want to eat. So for example, um, most radishes are somewhere in the realm of about an inch in circumference, or sorry, diameter, not circumference. Um, and, um, uh, and so that's about how far apart you want to space a radish. Um, beets, people generally grow them in the hopes of getting a three to four inch beet. Um, so that's about how far apart um, those seeds should go. And inevitably planting with kids, um, you're going to end up with like 10 or 20 seeds uh, across three inches compared to um, one seed per three or four inches. So um, if and when that happens, which is pretty inevitable, you can actually just go back through with a little pair of scissors after your seeds pop up and just snip out most of the plants um, and leave enough space. And then with plants, you want to just follow the instructions on the package. So let's take a look at package. So this is a variety. Um, this is kohlrabi. Um, this is a seed packet actually that um, this, this is a company that, that donated a bunch of seeds to us that we were able to share out with, with school teachers. Um, and um, you can see right in the, you know, you can see on the package exactly the recommendations for spacing. And those are basically the recommendations that you want to follow. Um, and I'm going to show you one more thing on here, though, just as like an FYI. Um, you can see what just got circled in yellow on your screen. The front of the package says that you want to, to sow or, you know, or plant in spring or late summer and that it's frost tolerant. Um, so that is not when you want to plant in the vast majority of Florida. If you plant kohlrabi in, um, in spring or late summer, um, you will probably be met with failure. Um, and then if you look on the back of the package, um, it tells you that in mild climates, you want to sow in fall and winter for cool season harvest. And I'm highlighting this simply because um, seed companies, um, when you buy you know, packages of seeds, in general, especially the small quantity seeds, they're going to give you um, planting instructions like this. 
when to plant things. And especially for the southern half of Florida, but even for most of the northern half of Florida, these directions um, are just not quite right. Um, they, the, these instructions are really generalized for the entire higher country and Florida is just really unique in that the bulk of our growing season is when most of the country is in the depths of winter and it's just too hot during our summer to grow things when most of the rest of the country is growing things. So um, we'll talk just a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, so another thing that I often hear folks struggle with when they're getting going with gardening or even early in their farming careers is um, uh, not, not fully getting your head wrapped around how often you might need to plant things in order to have a consistent supply of something. So this, in the world of farming, we call it succession planting. Um, so literally, you know, like one succession after another um, of a particular crop to make sure that you always have some of it. Um, so there's there's certain crops that fall into this category that I call you know, like one harvest and done, one and done, um, where you plant it, it grows, you harvest it, and you, you remove the entire plant. It's not coming back. So if you want more of that same plant, you have to plant it multiple times. Um, you know, like for example, um, a radish um, and all the other root crops, but like a radish generally is in the soil for 25 to 30 days. Um, that's super quick. So if you want a, you know, a constant supply of radishes, maybe plant a small amount of radishes every single week during radish season. Um, if you plant just one time, you will, after 25 to 30 days, you will have one small harvest of radishes and then you will not have any more, um, probably until the next growing season. Um, and then there's the things that fall into the category of um, multiple harvests. Um, so like two to 10 harvests generally, depending on how healthy your plants are, what part of the growing season you're in, how they get harvested. Um, so a lot of the leafy greens um, that, you know, things like when you're picking like whole big leaves, so from things like um, Swiss chard, kale, collards, um, those, if, if all goes well, you can, you can often get 10 harvests and sometimes even more off of a single planting. Um, but if you, um, you know, and if you know that you really want to make sure that you have kale, for example, for eight straight months, you will need to plant it more than one time. Um, and then all the fruits also tend to be multiple, multiple harvests. Um, but certain kinds like squash and cucumber, they're just so incredibly disease prone and insect prone um, that you may end up needing to plant those a few times because sometimes um, even though they theoretically can can, you can get 10 or 12 harvests off of them because of disease pressure, you may actually only get two or three harvests. So that's something to just figure out as you go over time. You'll start to see patterns and how many harvests you can get out of a certain thing. So another just quick rule of thumb, um, if the part of the plant you eat is a root or a head, you get one harvest. Um, like a good example of that that the people are often really shocked about if they've never grown it before is broccoli. Um, it takes about two and a half months to get a single head of broccoli on a plant. Um, that single um, head of broccoli that the plant um, is going to take up about two feet in every direction in your in your bed um, and you get one head of broccoli and that's it. So that's a long time to wait um, and a lot of space to get one head. Um, so that's, that's some good things to figure out. Those are some good things to figure out um, in terms of, um, of planning for your garden. And then if the part of the plant that you eat is a leaf or a fruit, you generally get two to 10 harvests. It's kind of a good way to think about it. Okay, do we have any, any questions about any of that, Mindy? And then I'll go into pests. Um, I think, I think we're good. I, I, I'm going to go back through and double check and we, if we missed any, we'll hit them at the end. Sounds good. And I'm going to just like wing through this part, um, because really we can summarize it by saying there's an incredible amount of pests that will find their way into your garden. Uh, caterpillars are, um, are a big category. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of caterpillars. 
Uh, true bugs are a category that um, we get a whole lot of in Florida. Um, and I don't know if you can see in this picture, you see this little piece right here? That's its mouthpiece. It literally pierces into the plant, just like a mosquito would into your skin. Um, and it sucks juice out of the plant. Um, and before it sucks juice out of the plant, it spits into the plant a little bit. And that's how it spreads a lot of disease. So it's both opening up little puncture wounds in your plant, depriving it of some nutrients, and generally spreading disease between plants. So um, true bugs cause all sorts of problems in your garden, um, and they're often not super obvious. They tend to be quite small. Not all of them are, but they tend to be quite small. That's a list there of some of the common ones. I'll show you some more. Um, stink bugs, you can see them in a, in a, um, a head of um, sunflower head here. They like hiding in little crevices. Um, this is some really typical damage that stink bugs do to tomatoes. Kind of looks like a constellation. It's beautiful, um, beautiful, but uh, damages your tomatoes very, very much. Aphids are another very common um, true bug. And you can see they can be in very large populations very quickly. Um, you will often, um, you often see ladybugs around when you have aphid infestations. And that's, that's a pretty fun way to, um, to interact with insects with kids is to watch, watch ladybugs eat. Um, kids' eyesight tends to be good enough that if they get really close to ladybugs and aphids, they can actually see them eating the ladybugs. Or excuse me, they can see the ladybugs eating the aphids. I'm just gonna skip that. I don't know why it's not skipping. Um, if you want to learn more well, something is frozen on my screen. There we go. Um, if you want to learn more about um, just some really neat things about insects, um, there's some resources. Whoa, all sorts of things happening on my screen. Sorry about that. Things are glitchy. Um, uh, there's some resources at the end that I'm going to show you. Okay, so I promised that I would do a better dive into nematodes. So nematodes are this invisible force that really impacts people's ability to succeed with gardens. In particular, unfortunately, with raised beds. Nematodes love raised beds. Um, so if you um, are trying and trying and trying and you cannot figure out why you keep hitting a wall of, of, um, of failure with your school garden in a raised bed, um, I highly encourage you to send off a little soil sample to the University of Florida Soil uh, Nematode Testing Lab and see what kind of nematode levels you might have in your soil. Um, nematodes are little microscopic parasitic roundworms, um, and some of them um, are parasitic to plants. Um, there's many, 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 many different kinds of nematodes. They're actually the most diverse species on earth, um, and in a single handful of soil in Florida, um, you can literally be holding tens of thousands of nematodes in a single handful of soil. They're pretty incredible and they, they can really pack a punch. So the, the carrots that you see in this picture have a type of root um, nematode called root knot nematode. These are from our raised beds at the office. Um, these carrots had actually been in the ground for about three months when I yanked them. That's as big as they were ever going to get, about one inch long due to nematodes. This is um, the root system of a tomato plant. Um, nobody would ever guess that that's the root system of a tomato plant, and it is infested with something called um, guava root knot nematodes um, quite badly. And um, that's, a, that's a fairly new one for the south part of Florida, um, but it's spreading fast. Um, here's some more. Um, these are from Q1, yeah, cucumber plants. This is root knot nematodes in cucumber plants. All those little balls um, and chunks on the root systems, there's, um, that's where nematodes have basically burrowed into the root system of a plant and like a gall has, has um, formed around it. Um, those are some very unhappy plants that can't pull nutrients and water up into their system the way they should be able to. So susceptibility to nematodes. Here's, here's the, the plus and minus. Um, nematodes don't like all plants in equal measure. They prefer, unfortunately, anything that produces a fruit, like tomatoes, um, and root crops, especially root crops that are high in sugars, like carrots and beets. Um, nematodes tend to avoid, um, or at least do much less damage to things that are in the brassica family. Um, and brassicas are a really big family of vegetable. Um, it's probably the biggest family of vegetable that we eat. 
Um, and it's things like kale, collards, broccoli, radish, bok choy, kohlrabi, things like that. Um, and then they generally tend to avoid um, herbs. Um, herbs are, they exude a lot of um, really strong chemical smell that, that nematodes tend to not like as much. So um, just to explain really quickly um, why nematodes um, tend to avoid brassicas and how you can actually use that to your advantage has nothing to do with this beautiful pizza on the screen. Um, this pizza just happens to be covered in arugula, um, and this is my favorite kind of pizza. So I put it there as an example of a kind of brassica. Um, and arugula actually happens to, re research is starting to show that arugula may have the biggest impact on nematodes of any of the brassicas. So if you have any, any care for arugula at all, this may be a really helpful crop to grow. Um, and, you know, that, that smell that brassicas have when they're cooked or when they start to rot that many people are really adverse to, especially kids, um, it's a particular sul sulfur-containing compound that is also um, very um, noxious to, um, to nematodes. Um, they, they like that smell and that chemical that, that's breaking down that compound um, just as, you know, just as much as your average kid likes the smell of boiling broccoli. Um, and so it's, it's that breakdown process, though, of, of brassicas that can actually help to reduce the population of nematodes in your soil. So after a, um, a brassica crop is finished, um, you may want to experiment with actually just kind of incorporating it down into your soil and seeing if it can make an impact on your nematode load. Here's a handful of other tips for controlling nematodes in your garden. Um, increase your the organic matter, that, that part of your soil that, um, that contains all of the healthy beneficial insects and mi microbial life and things like that. Um, a lot of those beneficial insects and microbes actually eat the nematodes that eat the, the root systems of plants. Um, so if just keeping your soil as healthy as you can and really paying attention to making sure that you have a healthy organic matter level in your soil can be really helpful. Um, you can plant nematode resistant varieties of some things. Not everything um, has a nematode resistance, um, but a lot of things are being bred for nematode resistance. Um, start with clean soil. And when I say clean, I very much put that in quotation marks. Um, so this is that what we were mentioning before of um, if you're starting with raised beds, you actually don't want to put in native soil because you're going to inoculate your raised beds with nematodes. So start with something like a bagged potting mix. Um, mulch, again, it helps to just keep the microbial life really help, really happy in your soil. Um, and the nematodes don't move very far in their life. So we move them from place to place. We are the primary way that nematodes move from location to location or from bed to bed on our hands, our tools, our feet. So making sure that you're, you know, washing your hands or your tools between beds is really helpful. Um, if you really, really love growing tomatoes and every single year you get them um, quite badly, um, you want to rotate tomatoes out or some other susceptible crop out of that particular bed for a few years. Um, there's been a lot of research with mixed results on certain kinds of plants being used to help decrease nematode levels. Um, marigolds are one that some people really swear by. Research isn't really supporting that enormously. Um, some research is showing mixed results. But regardless, things like marigolds and um, nasturtiums, they're beautiful, um, they're edible, and insects tend to like them. So even if they're not great at controlling nematodes, good thing to plant in your garden anyway. And then solarization is its own wild and crazy um, category. Um, it's the, the easiest way to think about it is that you put a very large sheet of plastic um, on top of whatever your growing space is, like a, a growing bed, clear plastic. Um, and then you use the heat of the summer sun to cook it. Um, it's kind of like putting saran wrap on a bowl and then putting it in the microwave. Um, it creates a huge amount of, of heat inside of that bowl. Same thing happens in your garden bed and it cooks. It literally cooks the nematodes, but it also cooks everything else in your soil too, all the good things as well. Um, I'm just going to keep going through this really quickly um, and then have time for questions in just a second. So there are a million and one common diseases, truly incredible amount. Um, the best way at this moment in time, um, since 
since we have a limitation on being able to actually bring samples into a lot of extension offices is to um, figure out how to take some really high quality pictures and send them into your local extension office. Um, you can also register for this really neat diagnostic service um, at the University of Florida. So your pictures will go out to um, many different experts. Um, it, um, I will sh I'll share this information with you. Um, I'm not gonna go through it right now, but we have some guidelines on what makes a really good usable picture for disease diagnostic purposes. Um, we get a lot, let's see, there we go. We get a lot of pictures like this um, with, um, you know, like what's wrong with this. And it turns out in this picture, well, um, oh, my computer's thinking again. Well, anyway, this right here, uh-oh, hopefully my PowerPoint does not crash. Microsoft PowerPoint is not responding. Um, well, I'm gonna have to restart the program. I'm having a lot of technical difficulties. So um, I um, So while you do that, is there yeah. something um, is there something in particular you're looking for that you want me to try to find or do you want to answer no. some questions? I want you to be yeah, able I to can do questions. Yeah, the, the bulk of what I have left. Oh no. Um, apparently Microsoft Office is now going to up, oh update in 29 minutes. Good. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, do you want to send me, sir, um, start asking me some questions? Sure. So while that's um, doing its thing, so um, one of the questions, and I think you addressed it a little bit more in the slide or two after when you were talking about brassicas um, and nematode resistance, um, and then also companion planting. So, um, so with brassicas, is there benefit of growing them simultaneously with other crops that may be susceptible to nematodes or is it more beneficial to grow the brassicas and then rotate in the other plants or use the brassicas as like green manure? I've heard of the mustards bearing those. Um, uh, can you clarify a little bit on that? And if people are looking yeah. for companion planting information, uh, is there a good uh, resource? Those are great questions. Yeah, so the um, it, it's really like the the verdict is out on um, on on that set of questions. Um, there's some research that is showing that planting brassicas in simultaneously with other more susceptible crops does help to reduce some of the issues that you have um, with, with nematodes. Um, other research is showing that it's really not until those brassica crops start to rot that you get the effect that you want. Um, so there's, there's major pluses and minuses to companion planting uh, or, or to, to, to like intercropping different families of things because it's generally a good idea to, to um, rotate around different families of plants on a regular basis anyway to decrease the amount of um, uh, diseases that build up in a particular, particular area. Um, and let's see, actually I just, this is working again. Let me pull this back up so that you can see some of these resources while I'm answering questions. I know we only have 10 minutes left, so we will just double time it. One second, y'all. Um, so yeah, the verdict is really just out on that one. And, and sorry, I thought I had this as pulled up as I wanted it to be. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, this has been par for the course in my week, unfortunately. I have a computer that's on its last leg and it is really on its last leg. Um, and then in terms of companion planting, there's lots and lots of guides that are out there about companion planting. One of the things that is really tricky, um, why this wouldn't start from the slide that I was on, but it did not. Um, one of the things that's really tricky about companion planting is that recommendations tend to be for other parts of the country. Um, and so sometimes what they recommend planting together doesn't actually grow well at the same time um, in Florida. The seasons are off. Okay. Yeah. So like for, you know, so for example, this totally um, seems like unrelated picture of salt that I have here. Um, I put this in here to remind people to take so much of the information that is available on things like YouTube, um, 
non-Florida websites, um, gardening books and things like that with a grain of salt um, because we have such an incredibly unique growing season compared to the rest of the country. Um, so many of the resources that are out there um, just, um, just don't quite align quite right with, um, with how and why we grow things and when we grow things the way we do in Florida. Um, so, you know, delve into companion planting books and things like that, but then just make sure that, um, that you're double checking with other resources, you know, things like your local extension office or, you know, visiting demonstration gardens to see when things should actually be planted. Um, let's see if this is going to work. This is, um, this is a super helpful book. There's, um, there's only two books that I know of that are specific to, and there may be more, this is just what I know of, that are specific to growing vegetables in Florida. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a great book. You can actually get it, um, you can get it through many sources, including the um, UF bookstore. And it contains all sorts of helpful charts um, that break things down into the different regions of Florida, because when you plant things, even differ substantially in the different regions. Um, and and I'll, I'll send all these links to Mindy and she can share them with all of you. Um, there's lots of really awesome plant and disease ID guides that are um, out and about if you don't want to take on trying to figure them out yourself. Um, I mean, sorry, if you don't want to send things off um, to have an expert diagnose things, um, if you want to try to figure them out yourself, there's lots of guides to do that. Um, and then this is a this is a super duper helpful um, guide that the University of Florida put out. It's in Cal basically takes the entire state, chunks it up into three different sections, and tell you and tells you month by month what you can plant when successfully, either as transplants or as seeds. Um, this is super helpful, um, and I encourage you to look it up. Um, and you just Google um, edibles to plant in whatever month you're looking for. Um, University of Florida and it'll pop right up. So that's what I've got. I am so sorry I did not leave more time for questions, um, but um, Mindy, you want to shoot more questions my way and then whatever questions we don't get to, um, Mindy can share with me and I can send out um, answers in a written form. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, someone asked if you could show the diagram that was at the beginning, the, the map. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And let me pull this back up. Um, and then there was a little, there was a question if, um, if sun hemp had been tried for nematodes, um, one of our master gardeners um, responded about them as green manure um, and that there's some evidence of in of uh, inhibiting effects, and he would be willing to send links if needed. Um, For sure. One of our yep. community gardens is working on a soil replenishment project, and I think they plan on um, evaluating the, the nematodes, but they also have other factors like flooding and whatnot, so yep. um, it's not an isolated experiment, if you will. Yeah, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with sun hemp, um, it has nothing to do with um, you know, like um, cannabis hemp, any any of that kind of hemp, it is completely and totally unrelated. Um, it just happens to have the same name in there. Um, uh, but it is something that's used traditionally in this region, or actually, actually not traditionally, but relatively recently, but it's growing in a lot of popularity. Um, it's a cover crop during the summer on farms, where instead of growing a productive crop, um, you, you plant something that's just intended to hold soil, build organic matter, um, help stop you know, flooding, things like that. Um, it's generally not a good um, plant for, for people in raised beds or community gardens and things like that because it's huge um, and it creates um, very woody stalks um, that you'd have to basically, you'd have to um, dig the whole plant out, um, send it through a wood chipper to get it to incorporate. So they, um, they, it is indeed um, showing quite promisingly that it's going to be really good for nematodes. But in terms of um, if you are not managing your property with a tractor, um, it's probably not a good solution for you. Um, so, and thank you for that. And there, they um, asked, can you go one slide earlier to the smaller map? Sure can. Um, and then, uh, 
oh a couple a couple points i wanted to make mention of when you like just like you mentioned sometimes the ingredients in a bag can change over time depending on where material is being sourced and what was available um double check your fertilizer um, bags because sometimes they may have ingredients in there that may be an allergen um, like sometimes peanut and things like that can be one of the ingredients so um, so even if it is OMRI certified, you still do want to kind of glance over those ingredients and then inquire with your extension office if you have questions, if you have problems identifying or, or call the company. Um, and then when you are talking about bugs, um, one of the things that uh, folks do in school gardens with bugs is they have like a bug viewer um, where they can uh, help those kids get it or small magnifying lenses so kids can get closer looks at some of those bugs and what they're doing and they love it kids some sure. kids go from like squealing and running away from bugs in the beginning <laughs> to wanting more time to see the bug um and so those are useful and i know some of our family nutrition program people use the same uh viewers for kids to be able to examine uh seeds close up like the seeds on a, on a strawberry um, so sometimes just having some uh, equipment handy is useful for engaging youth um, in the school garden. Um, and then we do have, we did have that map up. Let us know if you had a follow-up question in relation to that. Um, and you can always shoot us an email if you need something sent over in, uh, in a different format. Um, and then I had you talked a little bit about the soil and nematode testing lab. Can they go online and find that information or will that come in a follow-up email? I'll send it in a follow-up email. You, you can theoretically find it online. It, it's really buried. It doesn't pop up very well in a search engine, um, but you may be able to find it if you dig some. Um, you should be able to um, type in something like University of Florida nematode test lab or testing lab. Um, I think that it, it pops up somewhere on the first page of a search engine, but I'll definitely also send it out. Okay. Um, we did have questions as far as um, weeding, whether or not it was just aesthetic. Um, and, and I kind of elaborated a little bit in the chat box that when you were talking about that bare soil, that the weeds are opportunistic, but it's yep. not necessarily good to leave them because then they seed and make more of themselves and they tend to outpace the edible plants. And then they can also harbor, um, pests and disease that could impact edible plants. Is that a fair statement? It absolutely is. And another layer that I would add to that is also that they, they're going to compete for the same nutrients and water that your plants are, um, that, that you want to be providing to your plants. Um, and then the, 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 more, um, the more density of plant that you have in a system, the less airflow you're going to have through there. And because we do, you know, it's, we're so hot and humid here, um, that adds up low, low air flow paired with hot and humid adds up to issues with mold and mildew. So another reason to actually keep your beds weeded out is to simply just it, like literally increase the airflow around your plants so that you have less um, disease issues. Thank you. And then um, for one of my questions um, or like areas of surprise would be when talking about nematodes and you get those nodules on the root system, and then we're talking a little bit about some other plants that might be beneficial cover crops and things like that for nitrogen fixing and other talks we've had. But can you explain beans? If somebody pulled up beans or something similar to that and they saw nodules on the roots, is that natural to a bean plant or is that a sign of a nematode? Yeah, it, it may be both. Um, so um, those, those little nodules that you sometimes see on bean plants, if it's if it's in soil that is not infested with nematodes, um, those have um, very helpful bacteria in them that um, those, those little nodes that you see on bean plants um, they, that are actually pulling um, atmos um, atmospheric nitrogen. So nitrogen that's in a very particular chemical form um, and they, it goes through, basically goes through their digestive system and it comes out in a different form. And the form that it comes out in is a form of nitrogen that plants can actually um, take up. So growing things like beans um, are, are, are a really helpful way um, to get nitrogen into your system. Um, but again, they, you, you have to let the root system of those bean plants decompose in order to get the nitrogen, um, the, the, all of the nitrogen they have available 
um, into the soil. Um, otherwise, it's really held in those little nodes. Um, I've also pulled out bean plants that were in um, really nematode-rich, um, um, shall we say, soil, um, and the, those nodes don't look the same. Um, if you cut them open and, and let them sit out in the sun for a bit, uh, or just in open air, rather, they start to oxidize and they turn a, a funky color of pink. So if you, um, if you cut some of those nodes open on a bean plant and you um, let them sit for a few minutes and they start turning pink, um, pretty good sign that you have nematodes in there um, that, are, that are competing with the, the, uh, the microbes that are normally in there um, fixing nitrogen. So, but if, if it's really cool to know. Good. Yep. That is really cool to know. Okay, so, yeah. um, so if I did want to use some of the benefit from the roots of the of the bean plants, because beans are really popular with school gardens, community gardens, because yeah. they grow so well. Um, but I know that the bean plants tend to harbor white fly, which can really impact some of the other crops, because uh, mm -hmm. the white fly just kind of like to hang out in the bean plants. And we've noticed sometimes people don't harvest, they'll, they'll leave the bean plant that's on its way out there to harvest that last bean or two. Are they yeah. better to take that plant out and then should they leave the roots where they are to decompose or should they throw them in compost? That's a great question. Um, and, and yes, like get, get the, at least get the above soil part of those bean plants out as soon as they're done. Um, white fly is one of those little sucking bugs um, that spread some really significant diseases to a lot of the plants that, um, that, we, that we love, things like tomatoes. Um, so it's really up to you. Um, in really small spaces, I tend to just, um, I'll just actually come through with like scissors or shears and I'll just cut the tops of plants off that are done, um, you know, like nitrogen producing plants. And I, I let the root system stay in there. Um, other people really like to start good, like, you know, good and clean and start from scratch and then just yank the whole thing. Um, so it's a, you know, it's perfect personal preference. Um, you can also just push the whole plant under um, under the soil and the whole plant will decompose. Um, so that's another option. You just bury the insects with it. They won't <laughs> back up to the soil. Oh, and that was one that was one tip that I heard mentioned um, by Carol, um, what I who I finally refer to as our bug lady. Um, <laughs> as far as sucking insects like aphids, she had mentioned I normally don't like propose a lot of um, splashing on foliage for the reasons you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. She had mentioned sometimes with sucking insects that if you do spray them with water, some of those sucking insects, their mouth parts stay in the plant. And then the oh, interesting. That falls. And so that can sometimes mm -hmm. be beneficial. You just don't want to do it all the time. Yeah. Um, and do you have thought on that as far as um, irrigation above versus below uh, when it comes to the health of the plant? Definitely below. Um, as much as you can, um, you want to be watering right at the base of the plant and not getting the, the leaves really wet. Um, wet. Wet leaves are a perfect place for mold, mildews, and other diseases to set in. Um, so as much as you can, water just at the base of the plant. Um, most, most folks find that setting up some sort of automatic watering system is going to be their best bet. Um, it is incredible how fast raised beds can dry out. Um, and um, plants that get stressed over and over and over again by having major fluctuations in, um, in dry and very wet soil, um, just, I mean, they're, they're stressed. You know, it's just like, just like someone that plunges in and out of a deep freeze cooler and then into a furnace and then a deep freeze cooler and then a furnace, like it's really stressful. Um, so you, the plant will end up being more susceptible to, to health issues. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think you answered the questions um, either in the chat box itself or um, or over um, uh, the video. So, and thank you, Sarah, for sharing all this. I, I really, really, really want to grow right now. <laughs> I'm trying to be patient because of the time of year. Yeah. Is it, would you say it's better to wait at this point? I would wait. <laughs> 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 this is hard. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Sorry we ran over. And thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.